Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. Today we got Dr. John Mark Ruthven, who's with us. Uh, we're going to be discussing the new covenant and the charismata. It's going to be an exciting discussion. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Hey, everybody. Really excited to introduce our guest today, uh, John Mark Ruthven. And you'll see also with me uh, on the other line, you also have Michael Miller, who is joining us on this conversation. You'll notice that, that, that uh, Roundtree's not here. He's got a busy week working on a lot of stuff. Uh, some really exciting news that we will look forward to telling you about in the next week or two. But but, but until then, it must remain a, a hush. So uh, really cool stuff coming down the pike. We'll try remind you, we're entirely crowdfunded ministry. If you've been blessed by this episode or other episodes we've done. There are links in the description, both for PayPal or Patreon that you can give one time on PayPal or be a reoccurring giver there on Patreon as low as five bucks a month. Uh, there's extra content there. Uh, Michael, you want to, you want to, I, I guess I typically toss it over to you. How, how's it going down there in the basement? <laughs> basement boy is back. I, I'm doing well. Uh, yeah, uh, doing good. Church stuff is going well in Denver. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I've got a church that I pastor called Reclamation Church. Uh, we meet in the Platt Park area of Denver every Tuesday night. Um, so had a fun meeting last night. Excited to be here. Excited to introduce our guest to you guys. Uh, I got to read uh, Dr. Ruthven's uh, book, What's Wrong with Protestant Theology, about four years ago. And I had never heard anybody make the argument he was making for the continuation of the gifts. And I, and I guess that really wasn't your intention. Your intention was in the book to talk about some some, some carryover problems from the Reformation, while the Reformation was a good thing. Um, and, and that's what you addressed in this book. Uh, I'll put that up there if you guys can see that. What's wrong with Protestant theology? And then you really tackle the continuation of the gifts in this book on the cessation of the charismata. So I read both of these, and uh, it was sort of a dream to get you on the podcast and have this conversation. So thank you for joining us. Um, maybe you can tell our guests a little bit about yourself, where you're from, uh, what you do, um, and even maybe the well, uh, reason for these books. I used to <clears> – <throat> I, I don't know if I still am, but I used to uh, be a th theologian. At least that's <laughs> what they paid me to do is to theologize. <laughs> Uh, I kind of uh, kind of on on the fringes of the industry these days. Uh, there was a study done recently. I can't remember where it was done, but it was a, a, a thought experiment where if you laid all of the theologians in the world end to end, that they'd never reach a conclusion. And uh, that's, <laughs> that's, kind of, that's kind of where. Uh, <laughs> kind of where the field is right now. It's just, uh, it, I used to teach contemporary theology from the from the uh, Enlightenment on, and it was like such a vast, in my opinion, a kind of a vast wasteland that there was no interest really. And the, the farther along you got, the less and less interest there was in actually examining the m mission and message of Jesus which among other things was to bring the new covenant of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the spirit, which is the new covenant according to Acts uh, and uh, 2 Corinthians 3. And uh, so I... And so you, let me, let me back up before we dive into the some of the content today. You were a, a professor, is that right, up at Regent? Regent University. I also worked uh, for four years uh, helping Randy Clark get his doctoral program going at uh, United Theological Seminary. And now I'm working with his regular doctoral program, THD. Um, and um, we're also working on a PhD program uh, online for uh, the majority world. And we're collecting really good scholars already on board is Craig Keener and Michael Brown. And, you know, we're looking at some others. Randy Clark will be teaching on healing. And um, 
So we're going to have a PhD program built around some some pretty uh, knowledgeable people that can really contribute to the kingdom of God. Well, that's that's awesome. I'm actually kind of interested in knowing a little bit more about that. I don't know if we'll have time to to dive into. Maybe we can tackle some more on that at the end of the uh, the podcast today. But the uh, subject we have is the charismata and the new covenant. And I think uh, I'd like to dive into some of that content. And, and, you know, you already sort of alluded to what the new covenant is. Do you mind giving us a definition of that? Well, um, yeah, the, the, the two key passages on the new covenant, uh, well, the book of Hebrews, for one thing, but also 2 Corinthians 3. And... Um, if, if you already know about the the um, the new covenant, it's uh, in Jeremiah 31, 31. You know, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers, which was a, basically a book, a book of the law. And brought them out of Egypt and so on. They broke the covenant. But this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, which is an eschatological kind of reference. I will put my law among them or within them. As Jesus said, the kingdom of God is among you or in you. Um, And I will write it upon their hearts. It seemed to be a direct revelation with the result that I will be their God and they'll be my people. And he contrasts this new covenant experience of having the Torah, the teaching, written in the heart. He contrasts that with no longer shall each man teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they'll all know me. How? By this direct communication into the heart, you see. So what we're talking about here is it's a different way of knowing, a new kind of epistemology, not by education or indoctrination, but by revelation. And the old covenant is teaching by the scribes who were commissioned to teach the law of God. But now the new covenant is direct, immediate revelation into the heart by God. And that's the difference. There was a doctoral dissertation done at uh, a prominent cessationist seminary a few years ago where he did a great literature review of all the different positions on what the New Covenant was. And then his conclusion was that the New Covenant is New Testament rules that replaced or supplemented the Old Testament rules or law. You know, I I thought that was, you know, I think he really missed it. Um, I imagine for some people what you're saying, that can sound, uh, especially if you're Protestant, that can sound a little scary. Um, It it sounds as if, and maybe maybe there's a uh, something I'm misunderstanding in this, but if I was to hear that, I would think, does that mean that any person is just going to be able to randomly come to the conclusion of the gospel without... uh, without the gospel being preached or even um, worse well, can someone have a revelation that's contrary to scripture and an extra biblical revelation that would contradict scripture if this is all by revelation well remember what i just said is i read this out of scripture describing mm-hmm. the new covenant that's right and if you i mean so it isn't contradicting scripture it's fulfilling scripture and uh, it is obeying scripture um, and this is what First Corinthians or Second Corinthians three is all about when he talks about um, you know do we need letters of recommendation from you do we need diplomas you know to show that we're properly educated the praise of men whatever he says you are living proof of uh, our ministry which is to be ministers of a new covenant. Hmm. That's our job, they're saying. Not in a written code, like the teachers and the scribes, but in 
the spirit. For the written code kills, but the spirit gives life. You see, this is the new this is the new covenant that they're talking about here. And um, mm -hmm. so um, he says that today in the synagogue, the Jews read the scriptures with a veil over their minds. But when a man turns to the Lord, that veil is removed. Now they're talking about reading scripture here. You see, and Paul is contrasting that with the experience of the teaching spirit. Now, the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And um, we all with an unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord in this relationship of the spirit being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord Jesus, who is the spirit. It's not very Trinitarian, but, you know, that's what he says. <laughs> and, uh, and I mean, it matches what you get in John, you know, uh, 14 other places. I'll send you another comforter. And then a few verses later, he says, I will come to you. I'll send you the spirit baptize you in the spirit. I will be with you to the end of the age. Which is it? Well, it's both. You see? And so it's talking about what it is to be in Christ, is to be in the spirit, where your daily experience is I was praying and I felt the Lord tell me such and such and such and such. We hear that constantly and we don't challenge it that much because most of the time we agree with it. Does this mean you can get false revelations or crazy ideas or whatever you're thinking about? You know, God, should I marry Susie or marry, you know, uh, Kimberly? Well, you know, false choice. Maybe God didn't want either one, but sometimes we present things to God for him to answer and we put in our, we, you know, we, we shape the answers that God gives us. So there's a whole lot of problems with false prophecy. We're to judge it, to evaluate it. Paul says prophecy is not perfect. We know in part, we prophesy in part. It's, it's like looking into a fuzzy mirror. We don't always know if we're getting it straight or not. But he never in that process denies prophecy. He says, don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecy. But uh, judge all things and hold fast the good stuff. Eat the meat, throw away the bones. And so, so this argument that prophecy should cease because it's not perfect is not a biblical argument. So what, one of our, I would say our main audience is, is usually those who have uh, either they have come from an evangelical background and they've begun to embrace the gifts and see that there's a way to practice the gifts without it looking like charismania. And then there's yeah. another audience that we have that come from a, a more charismatic, crazy environment, and they're wanting to get serious about doctrine and that they're, there's a propensity and a tendency to throw away the gifts altogether because of how crazy it's been for them. And so we've been trying to meet that audience where they're at. Uh, and I, I guess I'm kind of so one of the things that we reason we asked that question to begin with was uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, nobody was going to look at it and go, oh, well, this is how Mormonism comes about. So what you're saying. So so knowing that, what is our relationship with the scripture? Um, it, obviously, it's not going to contra contradict the scripture. But but in the new covenant, if, if the new covenant means God uh, revealing to us. Uh, directly, then what is the relationship we have from the scriptures uh, with the scriptures at that point? At that point, it means we're obeying the scriptures. Okay, we're doing what the scriptures tell us to do, to expect the spirit of God to reveal himself. We don't understand what the term spirit of God is. You know, we think in terms of Trinity or procession or person or something like that, as if there's nothing else to be said. I did a study once, um, actually it ended up in a, as an appendix in my doctoral dissertation, 
um, where I took the 384 contexts of Spirit of God in the Old Testament and New Testament, 128 in the Old Testament, 256 in the New. And I went through every single context looking at what was said about the Spirit in each context. Over 85% of the total contexts had the Spirit of God acting in revelation, in prophecy, or in miracle, or power. One of those three, or sometimes all three. Um, the other context didn't make clear what the Spirit was doing. So statistically, if you threw those out, which I should have, but I didn't, your numbers really skyrocket way beyond 85%. Yeah, let me, let me go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you. When, so when you talk about the Spirit, you necessarily are talking about prophecy and revelation and power. And so when Paul's talking about, you know, the dispensation of the Spirit as the new covenant, we should have a clear idea of what he's talking about there. It's talking about revelation, prophecy, and power overwhelmingly. If you're a good linguist, you have to go with that. You see? Yeah, that's a that's a compelling point for certain. I think I want to ask what Michael was asking, maybe in a different a different way. Um, uh, if I if I were to hear from the Lord, and this is just an example, uh, you know, I got up and said, you know, thus saith the Lord. Um, everyone has to wear a blue shirt on Tuesdays, right? So I've got to speak, first of all, in King James, because that's the only kind of prophecy that's valid, right? Yes, so th thus, right. So, thus saith the Lord, uh, you know, everyone has to wear a blue shirt on Tuesday. Uh, I think Michael and I are both concerned that uh, there is a form of prophecy that we we absolutely want to be on board with, we want to embrace, we want to go for, but we also realize that there is... We there are is, on board with, yeah. No, we want to be on board with. We are a thousand percent. We sh this weekend yeah. we're, we're somewhere teaching a church on how to prophesy and and do this stuff. So we're all on board with it. Yeah. But but there is certainly a form of prophecy that people are afraid of. It's a caricature of saying, wait, so any random person can create a a new law that's binding on the conscience for all people everywhere. Uh, I think that's the question that Michael is asking. How how can we define this relationship to the new covenant that doesn't allow every single person to basically be laying the infallible foundation for all people everywhere in the church? Well, again, I think we just need to read our Bible. There's all kinds of correctives about prophecy. Let the other prophets or others judge. Uh, you know, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Don't despise prophecies. Stir up the gift that you received by the laying on of hands, he says to Timothy. You're letting this lack it go. Most commentators say that's a gift of prophecy. And uh, already you're getting this reaction in the church, uh, in the earliest church. You know, I can't believe any of this nonsense, you know. And they didn't have New Testament, you know, uh, stuff to to correct them at that point. Uh, bits and pieces here and there, le occasional letters. But uh, already they were ready to throw the ba baby out with the bathwater and even regress back into Judaism where the law was clear. Um, and this loosey-goosey subjective stuff of prophecy was just a little too much to handle. And that's where we are today. It's all where we've always been. And that's why overwhelmingly the church has been very suspicious of prophetic voices, usually because they're not the person, you know, the guy that clawed his way to the top. Um, so, uh, but the scripture itself says that you submit any prophecy to other people around you and you can submit it like you know the the, the third wave uh, charismatics you know i feel this is what the lord is saying i would submit it to you for judgment and evaluation and and let the other prophets judge i don't make any major decisions without checking with some of my prophetic friends would you pray about this would you make this clear and very often, if I ask them, "Is it this or this?" they say it's really not the, it's really not the main thing here. It's something else, and and 
I try, yeah. So the scripture itself is available and and commands us to judge the blue shirt prophecies, you know. And, you know, it isn't all subjective. Like Italian Pentecostal church, they were telling me about all King James English, of course, which made the argument pretty hard, you know, to say that they weren't adding to scripture when they framed it in King James English. I mean, come on. I mean, that made yeah. them a fat, juicy target to their Baptist friends. But this guy gets up and he says, thus saith the Lord thy God. And he goes on this wild prophecy and, and uh, the, the pastor says, well, I, I don't know if that was really the Lord from the pulpit. And the guy, prophet, jumps up again. And he says, thus saith the Lord thy God. That was to me, saith the Lord thy God. <laughs> so, <laughs> if, it's, if it's all left to subjective, uh, you know, or the prophet themselves, then no, of course it's crazy. But there are there are. Uh, correctives in the scripture itself for that kind of thing. So and we we're seeing a, we uh, a reaction, I'd say, to um, bad prophecy. But a lot of this kind of it goes back further than the modern era and the Pentecostal tradition. And in response to that, it, this is going back to the Protestant Reformation um, to, to make the case. Well, and, and I, I think you're right. I'm not disagreeing with it, but to make the case that the new covenant is uh, the spirit of prophecy, that that is the new norm for the people of God to have the spirit of prophecy is in some sense also to make the case that those who are cessationist uh, are verbally denying the new covenant reality while experientially living with it. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I think they, of like uh, the guys we've had on the podcast in the past who who tell the stories of of feeling like God has prompted them to do X, Y and Z. But they would never right. call it prophecy. Right, right, right. It's a difference in vocabulary. Thank God they break their own rules, you know. And um, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like it's like Muslims, you know. You, you, uh, uh, thank God they don't follow their own Quran, you know. Kill the infidel wherever you may find him, that kind of thing. Don't make friends with infidels, whatever. I hope I'm not being too offensive here, but, you know, they're nice people because they violate their own doctrines. Um, so. I, I want to take this back to the Reformation, uh, just because you mentioned the Westminster Confession offline before we started the podcast, and specifically where that might have misled us, um, and, and the Reformation where it might have misled us, in how it improperly defines the New Covenant. And then, therefore, sort of sets us up for a wrong expectation to what it looks like to be the people of God. Um, can you go back to that and, and elaborate some on that? Yeah, well, Calvin was more into the New Covenant, but um, there's not a lot of talk about exactly what it is. You, you know, they talk about the importance of it. They talk about Jesus mediating it and how that's why he died on the cross was to bring us a new covenant. But very often the new covenant is squeezed into Protestant concepts of salvation. And you're in the new covenant if you're regenerated and, and you know, go to heaven when you die. Uh, but that's not what the scripture explicitly says it is. Um, if you'll permit me to read what the punchline yeah, of the book of Acts is. Um uh, and this was what I had written on in the uh, appendix four in the cessation, in the new cessation version. Um, uh, it says, uh, basically, I argue that that the Pentecost narrative uh, is a fulfillment of Isaiah 59, 19, 20, and 21, with a lot of references to the next five verses in that context. And um, I argue that that uh, when Luke introduces it, the title of the Pentecost narrative is when the day or the holiday of Pentecost was fulfilled. If you look at the original Greek there, that's what it says. But they always translate it when the day had fully come. So what? You know, who cares? But 
they're interested i'm interested in how it was fulfilled and i think that was luke's case and luke basically is paraphrasing um isaiah 59 19 20 and 21 and i'll read that it says so they shall fear the name of the lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun they're fearing his glory from this universal picture of people from all over will fear the name of the Lord and fear his glory. Why? For he will come like a mighty rushing stream, which the wind or the spirit of the Lord drives. Now that's translated in the King James Version. Uh, it's so bad, it's not even wrong as a translation. It said, when the enemy comes like a flood, I will raise up a standard against him. Not even close to the Hebrew. Uh, but that's what this is really saying. For he'll come like a mighty rushing stream or, or torrent, which the wind or the spirit of the Lord drives. Well, that's the Pentecost noise, you know, mighty rushing wind. And he will come to Zion as a redeemer. You remember Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem, tarry in the city, makes a big deal out of that. As redeemer to those in Jacob, the Jews, who will t who turn from transgression or repent, says the Lord. Now here's the covenant. Here's where we ought to pick up, prick up our ears. And this is what Peter is quoting when they say, brethren, what shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized. And that's where Protestants put the period. OK, but he goes on to say, and then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is what you're seeing here. For and that little gar there in Greek introduces a proof text. I finally came to that conclusion for this promise covenant is for you, your children and those who are afar off. And since you can demonstrate clearly that there's intertextuality between this uh, Isaiah passage and the Pentecost narrative all the way through the themes of fear and glory and and um, uh, Redeemer Zion repentance you know on and on and on he comes to the conclusion and here's here's what he's citing in typical rabbinic shortened form where they condense a longer passage down into a short passage like we'd say Watergate or 9-11, you know, for a larger picture of a story. As for me, this is my covenant with them. What was Pentecost? It was the celebration of the covenant. And what was offered at the first covenant? The voice of God, which they rejected. No, no, Moses, you speak to us, lest he speak to us and we die. We can't handle that voice stuff. So they got a book. Okay. And, but now they're in a situation where the covenant is being offered again. And so it's being explained as to what that covenant really was in the beginning. This is my covenant with them, says the Lord. What is that? Prick up your ears. My spirit, which is upon you, singular, Jesus. This Jesus whom you crucified, God has exalted and made Lord in Christ and is pouring out that which you see and hear. And my words, prophetic words, which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart out of your mouth, nor out of the mouth of your children, or out of the mouth of your children's children, says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. That doesn't sound very cessationist to me. Okay. That is the new covenant that Peter was quoting as the punchline to the Pentecost address. And that's why I believe that when Jesus is introduced in the Gospels, all four Gospels, two or three witnesses are required to establish something. There's four Gospels. They really establish it. All four Gospels introduce Jesus in the same way. Now, when you introduce somebody, you take the most prominent or important feature about that person as you're introducing them. Isn't that generally true? Okay. 
like in my case. They say, this is John Ruthven, all pro middle linebacker for the Seattle Seahawks. You know, that's the way they <laughs> Because it's the most I typically introduce I typically introduce Miller as Michael Miller. He's smarter than he looks. That's typically how I I introduce <laughs> him. <laughs> okay. Thank so, you. Thank you for that. My side point. Is, I got your back. <laughs> when, they, when they introduce Jesus, what do they say about him? If you're a good Protestant, you would say this is Jesus who, who who's going to die on the cross for your sins. But it doesn't say that. It says he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And it contrasts with John the Baptist's repentance and baptism, you see, which is preparatory for the big stuff. And that is the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which means you're being baptized into the gift of prophecy and power. See, God's presence. So, okay. Where did the Protestant, where did the Protestant Reformation get it off then? Like what is it that you're, if you were to summarize that in one sentence, where would you say the Reformation diverted? Uh, two, two reasons why they rejected the gift of the Spirit for today. First is the Pope, where he could write encyclicals and make up scripture as he went on. And anything the Pope said ex cathedra from his chair was infallible, you see and something revealed to the Pope. And so there's ongoing revelation to the Pope uh, all the time as an apostle. He could write scripture and write encyclicals and, and, and have total authority by what he said. The Reformation says, no, 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 no. All the revelation we're going to get about the gospel came from the original apostles, period. No more than that. That's one source, the Catholics. The other source was the Radical Reformation where they picked up the ball and ran with it. When it says, you can be your own interpreter of scripture. And they started reading passages like this and about the Holy Spirit and about the gifts of the Spirit. And they says, well, it's telling us to use these things. Why aren't we doing it? Why are we listening to Luther that says it ceased? Why don't we just go ahead and have these gifts of the Spirit operating? Guys like Thomas Munzer, for example, um, Luther got in a big fight with him, and he says, I don't care if you have the Holy Spirit or not. All I'm going to believe for my doctrine is scripture. He says, Munzer, I, don't, I wouldn't believe Munzer if he swallowed the Holy Spirit, feathers and all. And he didn't care, you know. <laughs> and and uh, he's, uh, but I mean, it's it's funny on one level, but when you look at what Luther said, I don't care if he has the spirit speaking. I'm not going to listen to him. Which for my money is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So you would say that there is. Uh, and, and if we're going to be gracious of Luther, it seems as if Luther is maybe suggesting that he needs more empirical data um, that he can that he can subject to the lens of scrutiny rather than someone's subjective experience, which again we're we're coming up on uh, you know just the way that the Reformation would view uh, the onworking of the Spirit specifically in revelatory gifts versus how Munzer was at that time that that, that those two views were coming up against each other uh, you know. Uh, Luther is post enlightenment. He wants to go back to the sources. He wants to go and read what does the original source material say about this matter. But when it comes to your prophecy, when it comes to the words of the spirit, I can't see that source material. It, would it be a generous way to look at Luther to say, is he really talking about the Holy Spirit or what he uh, is ca he characterizes? Was, he was, I believe, you know, uh, we can be generous with Luther, but his hyper grace theology you know, sin broadly and you'll appreciate the forgiveness and grace of God. You know, I mean, this kind of stuff. Toward the end of his life, he actually said, uh, because of this doctrine that he, he, spent, he said, he says, my people are seven times more sinful than they were under the Pope. Jesus paid it all. Who cares? I can sin all I want, you know. Uh, Luther wasn't infallible. As a matter of fact, his position about spiritual gifts, and I'm trying to quote him here, he said, 
all these people with their fevered dreams and all their prophecies and all their, you know, carrying on, he says, uh, they don't pay attention to I or St. Paul. Notice the order. Um, he really felt that he had a better handle on, I think, theology than even Paul. And, you know, Luther was not exactly a shrinking violet. He had, he had an ego the size of a barn. And, um, uh, you know, to be, to be, you know, fair, he had tremendous insights. In some ways, he did wonderful exegetical work. Um, but he also was very threatened by the charismatics in the in the in the Counter Reformation, and he signed off on on the extermination of the peasant revolt, where a hundred thousand mostly counter uh, radical Reformation people, charismatics, w were killed. So when you say he signed and, off on that, I mean, I, I I remember I've I've read some of Luther's work saying that he he didn't care for the peasant wars and made certain statements that looked like he endorsed it, but, but there are statements written that he, he condemns the peasant wars and maybe I'm getting this wrong and I'll, I'll kind of, you know, defer to your scholarship on the matter. Um, but also when you talk about charismatics of that day, are, are you speaking of the Anabaptists that he was writing in, in, in contrast to when you speak to the yeah, charismatics they, of his day? They were, they were some of them. Yes. Yeah. They weren't, it was a very diverse group and it split, you know, exponentially. Uh, into different groups, and it's hard to know who he's addressing in some cases. But, um, yeah, I don't want to be too hard on Luther. I mean, he did amazing things for his time. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I think he crossed the line on some issues. So what we're seeing, though, is, as far as the problem of the, of the New Covenant and, and Reformation theology is that the 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 work of the Holy Spirit was relegated largely to soteriology. And, right. uh, and in some sense, that's actually not the predominant view of the scriptures, both Old and New Testament. Whenever Paul talks about the New Covenant, or whenever you read about it in Isaiah or Jeremiah, you're talking about a people that is characterized by prophecy, not necessarily uh, soteriology descriptions. Is that correct? Oh, right, right. You know, I mean, Warfield, for example, says uh, that the Westminster Confession was criticized for not having a, an item about the Holy Spirit in it. And he says that's because we prefer to have nine chapters devoted to it. And he goes on to say that the Holy Spirit is active in each of the sequence, the ordo salutis of the the stages of salvation, you know, uh, and uh, the spirit is active in each one of those. And uh, that's all the spirit he needs at that point. Um, very much against prophecy and healing miracles and other kinds of stuff. He had some very curious ideas about miracles. But I'm, I, I don't, I, I back up about Luther. I shouldn't be too harsh on him, but at the same time, there were some things he did and said that were pretty, you know, that really violated, in my view, what the scripture was trying to get across. Sure. I mean, in Luther, the, Luther, in the, go ahead. In the interest of, of, you know, protecting his own turf, especially toward the end of his life. And, uh, of course, he was in a fight, a, literally a life and death fight. And, uh, of course, there's going to be some pretty shrill things that he said. Um, Josh, what were you going to say about oh, I, Luther? I, I was just going to say that Luther yeah, definitely exhibits character that even Lutherans today would go, okay, we, we agree with, like, in the large swaths of theological literature that he, he writes, but there's literally a website called uh, Lutheran Insults, and you can just refresh the page, and, there, and it's just, you'll never see the same insult twice. I mean, the man was, he was a <laughs> crass guy, uh, you know, he, he didn't mind using uh, rhetoric uh, that, would, that would have put m many of us to shame and cause us to blush. Uh, he was anti-Semitic yes. towards the end of his life. I mean, Luther was a man of faults, like any 
of us are for sure, and maybe him more than others. I don't mean to to, to brush under that. So so I would agree with you. He's he's definitely a product of his time. Um, I when I want to hear the statements of Luther, I'm always trying to contrast it with who is he talking to and what is he talking about. So like even with your statements about prophecy, I'm like, man, I want to I'm going to go see where that source material is so that I can see what who was he talking to that when they were talking about all these visions because there were some wacky Anabaptists that lived around that time. Oh, absolutely. That had, absolutely. That I would probably willingly condemn with the same kind of language. Yeah. So, yeah. But he made, he, made, he made the Thessalonian mistake of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Certainly. You know, and, uh, but that was the other reason. Prophecy. Yeah, yeah. But um, anyway, um, again, if I was in the same situation, I don't know if I would have handled it any differently, you know, but he was you know, his life was always on the line. Things were very tough. And then he had to deal with this radical reformation, radical in the sense of going back to the root as they saw it back to, you know, Christian experience, even to the point where they had the inner light. And because the Bible was written by men, they didn't want to have the Bible even. I mean, some of them were that radical. Let me, let me ask you this question. I have a question from our audience. This question is from Jim. I apologize that I'm looking so far over. That's where my screen's at today. Uh, Jim says, if the old covenant uh, is the letter and the new covenant is direct revelation, then why look to the scriptures in the new covenant? Um, I, I think that he is just contrasting what we would call the Old Testament, New Testament. We have all these New Testament letters. If the new covenant is divine revelation, then why do we need a book that we circulate? Um, and, and maybe we're conflating and confusing terms, uh, but I'd love for you to help clear that up if you, if you wouldn't mind. Right. Well, the Old Testament scriptures themselves are loaded with prophetic experiences. Probably the number one event in most people's lives is their encounter with God who spoke to them and they spoke back. And it's a big, big deal. I mean, one of the maxims of scripture, listen to the prophets and you will succeed. I mean, come on. Uh, it's already there in the Old Testament and they're, they're, they're anticipating experientially what was to become normative in the New Testament. Um, the the, the uh, we don't throw out the Bible simply because we're having spiritual gifts. Uh, the spiritual gifts, and this is uh, this comes from the Reformation, especially post Reformation. If you have a prophecy, it necessarily, if it's from God, it necessarily has to be perfect, and it necessarily has to add scripture. You say the same thing about a miracle. You know, if Aunt Clara gets healed of psoriasis, you immediately have to rush out and add a chapter to the book of Jude. I mean, it's it's there's an absurdity to that. Uh, miracles and prophecies don't prove or add to Scripture. Uh, they simply obey Scripture if they're done right. And uh, with the Scripture being fully aware of the problem of false prophets, certainly in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So establishing the canon of Scripture as the source and solid ground of our doctrine, of our understanding of God, uh, and understanding of spiritual gifts, Scripture is indispensable, okay? But the formation of Scripture by revelation from God is a separate issue of the gifts of prophecy and revelation later on that are described in this revealed document. But the formation of the canon is something I believe God superintended and uh, that he guarded. And for my money, you know, I believe in inerrancy of Scripture. I'm very, very conservative about Scripture. But Modern prophecies do not add to Scripture. They obey Scripture. That's it. That's I think that's probably the second or another issue about the Reformation is those two things got conflated. The idea of prophecy being the same thing as Scripture. Uh, right. Those two things. Because the Pope prophesied and added to, to the canon, basically. 
And so that's the mistake Protestants have been trying to avoid ever since. Um, uh, well, the mistake of the Pope. Um, and, and then by doing so, they fell into another mistake by equating prophecy and scripture. Yeah, so maybe we could speak yeah. on this. Uh, I, I know we only have like seven more minutes left in this program uh, as we have an hour-long program. One of the things I'd love for us to touch on, as you're talking about prophecy and the New Covenant, and the New Covenant is like this mediated revelation from the Spirit, an interesting concept, but it, but it causes me to draw my attention to the, to the Old Covenant and the way that God would speak prophetically in the Old Covenant. Uh, would you find a more continuity between Old and New Testament co uh, prophecy or discontinuity between Old and New Testament prophecy? We've got guys that we host here on the show, very wide different Grudem. views. Guys like Keener would say more continuity. Guys like Grudem would say discontinuity. He, you know, got the prophets of the Old Testament, infallible scripture, the New Testament seems to be different. The apostles took that kind of prophetic office of the Old Testament, whereas Keener would say, hey, or D.A. Carson maybe would say, hey, there are two, seems to be two different bearing authority of prophetic ministry in the Old Testament where uh, there was a school of prophets, but nobody wrote down their stuff. Nobody nobody logged that content as it was infallible foundation for all people everywhere. Uh, and, you know, the New Testament stuff seems to go on that same measure. You've got a revelation from John, scripture, prophecy, but then you have a different kind of revelation that took place in local churches. So, so would you find more of a continuity or discontinuity between Old Testament and New Testament prophecy uh, in, in light of this discussion on New Covenant? Yeah, I would, I would say uh, that uh, Paul actually picks up on Moses Joshua and the 70 elders are prophes prophesying and Joshua, you know, says, should I tell him to shut up and stop? I mean, you're the only prophet and, you know, you're the only one we should listen to and you're writing the Bible. I don't know if he knew that at the time, but, <laughs> uh, you know, and Moses response was generosity and, and the ideal. He says, I wish all Israel were prophets. And you get an echo of that in 1 Corinthians 14. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but rather that you prophesied, you see. And there's Moses' echo coming out there, I think, because prophecy was the normative experience of the Christian. You know, and it isn't prophecy for prophecy's sake. It's prophecy to draw us into intimacy with God, that I will be their God and they will be my people. That's the goal of the new covenant. You see, uh, identity and intimacy is the number one thing that you run into when Adam is being instructed. The seven major themes that come instructing Adam. Number one is this identity and the very life of God was breathed into him, just as Jesus breathed into the disciples. He's creating a new race of people now based in a new covenant relationship with God. And um, so, um, you know, again, uh, prophecy is a tool uh, that God gives us in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I don't think that anyone who received a revelation from God in the New Testament would experience it any differently than someone who received a revelation in the Old, in the Old Testament. I would say they'd be the same kind of thing ranging from a vague impression to direct words or whatever, you know. So and, this uh, is a, a, a problem for people, because in some sense, you would agree with the statement that even Old Testament prophecy was still fallible. Uh, what was infallible and inerrant were the, the writing of the scriptures. Yes, yes. I, I, you know, you see, Protest, I mean, typically Protestants, especially Warfield, confused the means by which uh, scripture came to be by revelation with the process of revelation. You see, and because prophets received revelation to write scripture, therefore we can't have any more prophets which is nonsense. I mean, pr uh, scripture is simply a subset of the prophetic experience. It's what re is recorded 
and God superintended that to be a special category of revelation that we record and that we uh, uh, submit to. But that doesn't mean that the process of prophecy uh, stopped any more than the use of language. Well, we say we can't use language anymore because the Bible used, used language. You know, that's absurd, you see. Or we can't, we can't prophesy anymore because prophets wrote the scripture. They're not related. It's not the same thing. It's scripture itself that commands us to prophesy. And Moses' ideal was that all Israel would be prophets. You know, are they going to write scripture now? No. It's just that they're hearing from God as they always should have done until the serpent tempted Eve not to listen to God anymore. You see, and that was the temptation that came to Jesus. You know, go by the word of God written, Jesus. You don't have to hear from God anymore. And Jesus said, you live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, direct, immediate revelation. He was talking about the, the, the new covenant, but he was also talking about the process that existed since Adam. If Adam would have listened, he wouldn't have fallen. But his sin was not listening. And this is what comes up in Hebrews 6. When you fall away from Christianity, what is it you fall away from? And that's what you get in Hebrews 6. Endless amounts of ink was spilled on can you fall away or not or whatever. That's not the question. The question here is, when you fall, when you, if you fall away, you're falling away from this. And here's what it is. It's impossible to restore again to repentance those who, and there's five different ways of God speaking to you that gets violated. It's really one thing. It says who have once been enlightened. How? By revelation, right? Who have tasted the heavenly gift, which is what? Revelation and prophecy, who have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Remember, revelation, prophecy, and power, and have tasted of the goodness of the Word of God. We always think of the Word as being Scripture. Scripture itself points to the Word usually as being prophetic revelation. And five, the powers of the age to come. Five different ways of God revealing himself. And he says, if they then commit apostasy, since they crucify the Son of God on their own account and hold them up to a, a contempt. What's that God, what is denying these charismatic experiences got to do with Jesus being crucified again? Because the crucifixion was the mediation of the new covenant of these five things we're talking about. Amen. And that if you violate that co covenant, Jesus is going to have to die on the cross again to renew the covenant. And that ain't going to happen. Hmm. See, the same argument is made in 1 Corinthians 11 by Paul. If you don't, you know, if you take, partake unworthily of the body and blood of Jesus and don't discern the body, he's not talking about a wafer or a piece of bread with theological significance. He's talking about the body of Christ. By one body are you baptized into one spirit, uh, by one spirit into one body. And they were shunning charismatically gifted people and thereby breaking the covenant of the spirit. That's why Paul says, many of you are weak and sick and have fallen asleep. Why would he say that about breaking a covenant? Because that is the Deuteronomy 28 penalty for breaking the covenant. You get sick, 
week, you die. Let's see. Interesting. I mean, it's serious. It's serious stuff. But it, Paul's making the same argument in, about the Eucharist as um, Hebrews is making in Hebrews six. So, so you're saying that in that th- that those who shun charismatic believers i've never heard this interpretation before so so you have to walk me through it um those who are shunning charismatic believers like in the church of corinth if i think of d.a carson you know there's distinctions amongst them some say we're apollo some of say we're of paul there's distinctions also on on the 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 rich and the poor uh the way they take communion there's distinctions on who's got the more supernatural gifts you know is it those who speak in tongues those seem to be more so you're saying that there's distinctions specifically on the distinction of of those who might say i have a, a leadership gift and a mercy gift and they say i have tongues and like we don't need tongues you're saying that 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 is breaking the covenant for a, one believer to say to another, I have no need well, of you? The, no, the context was the so-called love feasts, you know, where they bring potluck and whatnot, apparently. And, and some of the poor drunk. people had nothing. Yeah, and some people had nothing to bring. And so the elite are saying, you know, for free meals, you know, get out of here. You know, we don't need you. And so the body of Christ was being broken up mm-hmm. by not recognizing them as being members in the new covenant, members gotcha. of the body of Christ. And that's why I needed the clarification. They, yeah, they didn't discern that body. Yeah. I think I lost you. Um, that's I, why I, they broke. Yeah. I lost, I lost your internet connection. So you said they didn't discern the body. Say that one more time. Well, they didn't discern the body. And that's why uh, Paul is saying, basically, you're crucifying Christ all over again. You know, you're, you're forcing him to renew the covenant, which he never should be doing. You broke it. You're going to pay for it. And uh, that's why you're weak and sick and you're going to die because you didn't discern the body. Jesus in the way, but the body of Christ that you broke up, that's what he's upset about. Excellent. Okay, so so I've got a couple people in the comment section asking, you know, just for clarification on a couple points. I'm going to reiterate what I hear you saying, uh, and then I want you to clean up everything that I've said that's incorrect. So, hey guys, uh, this happens has happened the last two days. I don't know if it's an internet problem or a hardware problem. I apologize. We got a disconnection uh, with uh, the internet, it, it, it appears. So I'm just going to try to clean up everything just now. Uh, I was kind of going into a rant trying to clarify uh, what I believe Dr. Ruthven was saying uh, about the New Covenant. So I just want to touch on that just for a moment. Uh, he spoke on the New Covenant and specifically how uh, we are in the, the Jesus has mediating the New Covenant with the body with his blood uh, this is the new covenant when he speaks to the disciples on uh, the last day of the, the, the feast where he's uh, uh, about to go to the cross so uh, here this new covenant is mediated through his session he goes sins on high sins into heaven and now is mediating the work of his ministry through the spirit and that is the new covenant he says that hey if you look in uh, the scriptures and you look at the work of the spirit a lot of uh, systematic theologies and particularly reformed systematic theologies speak in great detail of the work of the spirit in regards to soteriology but if you look linguistically more of a biblical theological lens he'll say that the the use of the spirit is is typically uh, more often than not accompanying with power for prophetic and revelatory styles of ministry uh again a great study to kind of look at and, and work through yourself uh, but but he seems to suggest uh, that this new covenant is this kind of divine revelation mediated by the spirit more than legal laws that have been placed against us but a a working of the spirit revealing things to our heart here in the present now uh, i'm not seeing miller and or uh, dr ruthven coming back into the chat so i feel bad uh, but i am probably going to wrap this episode up so guys thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Ruthven for spending some time with us. I want to remind you guys of a conference that we do have coming up. The Pursuit Conference is October 4th through the 6th. You can register at the website there, pursuitconference.org. It's just, I think it's in like, 
a week from now. Uh, it's it's very very soon. Maybe it's even further from that, but like a week and week and some change. Uh, it's going to be an awesome conference. We're going down to Woods Edge. It's primarily a pastors conference. Now, if you're not a pastor and you want to go, you're absolutely welcome to come. Uh, but this conference specifically, what we're trying to tackle is how to train pastors to train their church in the gifts of the Spirit. So if that's something that you're interested in doing. You can register there at pursuitconference.org. Uh, again, anyone can register. We're taking taking registration from anyone, uh, but you'll see right there, Sam Storms, Matt Chandler and Jack Deere are going to be the main speakers. Uh, Michael Roundtree and Michael Miller will be doing prophetic ministry uh, during that time. Uh, and, and I will be hosting a, a roundtable discussion between Jack, Matt, and Sam, uh, and also Michael Miller. Uh, we're going to be talking about the gifts of the Spirit and how to train our churches in those gifts. So, uh, guys, again, I apologize. This is the second time this has happened. I'm going to find out if this is a hardware or software issue and won't happen again. Uh, but, guys, I hope this has been a blessing to you. Uh, if you would, go ahead and hit the subscribe subscribe button, like the videos. We're coming out with content just like this every week. Fortunately, we were coming to the end of our program and we were going to have to wrap up either way. Uh, blessings, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you next Monday uh, as we discuss a, a new book on prophecy, the power, purpose, uh, and I think it's power, purpose, and plan of prophecy in the New Testament. It's going to be an exciting episode. We'll see you then. Blessings.